report on this. Okay, so last we were working, we were doing the Kokomo <laughs> thing. And let's continue with that. I'll share my screen. And here we have this Kokomo. Now we talked about this last time, the K locks, do anyone remember what that stands for? Kilo lines of code. Uh, lines of code. Exactly, kilo lines of code. And we said that the amount of effort which is measured in Chodshe Adam, by the way, did anybody look up that book, Mythical Man Month? It was, no. it was like the, the book, it was like the, the uh, how do you say, the soft reading for hardcore programmers. In other words, easy, but like discussion about programming and about working at companies, but it's quite old by now, but it's still kind of a famous book. And he got that name, the mythical man month. It sounds like the mythical mammoth, but here's where you have man month, Chodshe Adam. How many months of a man to work will it take to do it? That's you calculate by taking the number of lines of code that you think it will be. I mean, I don't know. The problem of course is how are you gonna get this number? But how many lines of code do you think it will be approximately raised to the B power, which we said depends on whether it's a small, medium or large kind of software. Embed, right, embedded we said is more complicated. Organic is a small group. And multiplied by this coefficient A, which also changes. And C and D are used to convert that effort into how many months we actually gonna be. Like if it's a hundred man months, we don't know how many months that is because it could be you should do it in one month and have a hundred people. Or it could we do it two months, have 50 people. So first we're gonna convert and figure out how many months it should be. And then we're gonna figure out how many people it should be based on how many months it is and how much effort. So this is, ba how do they get these numbers? Where do these numbers come from? Basically from analyzing uh, in the past what, you know, uh, other projects, how big they were, how long they took, how many people they took, and and they and what of the ones that were successful, let's say. Okay, so let's go on. So this is um, a calculator. You can find these things on the internet, I think. Um, a Kokomo calculator, you know, you just put in the numbers and it tells you, it figures out everything, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, and now we have this other table and I'm gonna skip the tables for now. We'll get back to them. Um, yeah, we'll get back to the tables. Now we're gonna make the Kokomo a little bit more uh, precise. The calculation of effort that we did before was A times thousands of lines of code times B, but we're going to modify it with this EAF, effort adjustment factor. Um, and what this says is like, it relates to what people we have. In other words, if we have very gifted programmers or very good hardware, maybe we'll get it done faster or conversely slower if we have bad people. So these are like adjustment factors. Now, if the adjustment factor is one, it's not gonna do anything. Multiplying by one is not gonna do anything. But if the adjustment factor is like, is, is um, less than one, then it's gonna mean it's gonna take less time to do it. Less than one will lower it and more than one will raise it. So mathematically. So here we have the next thing. These are some of the things that may drive the cost, cost driver attributes, things that may make it take longer or slower. So for example, your software engineer capability, how good is your programmer? How much application experience does he have? How much has he been using this language? New language for him or not? Has he used has he used virtual machine experience? Has he, this is about his personal. And then there's also project. Um, will we be using software tools or are we doing everything by hand? You know, uh, not sure what required development schedule means exactly, but application of software engineering methods. Will we be following certain principles of programming or just everyone does what they want? So these kinds of things will affect the result. Hard attributes. Um, do we have to have it run at a certain speed? Does, does, that get, does, does the program have to be very fast? In which case it might take us longer to do it. 
Do we have memory constraints? Do we have to use a certain small amount of memory? It might make it harder to program it. And other parameters like that. Rec turnaround time, how fast it has to produce, how fast the software has to be able to produce results. Um, is our virtual machine stable or volatile? Other issues. Okay. So now what we do is we say like this, we make this table here, here the same four things that you saw over here, personal attributes, project attributes are over here. And for example, time, or let's look, the easiest one to understand is personal. So let's talk about that. Your, your uh, let's say programmer capability. Let's just take one, for example, your programmer capability. If his capability is namuch means low, if it's low, then your programmer capability, then you should multiply by 1.14. That'll make it slower, make the project slower. If your programmer capability is better, then you can multiply by 0.86. That'll make it faster. Okay. And the same thing for all the other things. Notice some of them, there's a, there's a smaller than one number here because if your virtual memory is volatility, if your volatility is low, the move, then that's good. So it'll make it faster. If your main storage constraint, in other words, your memory limitations, you, you, you have a lot of limitations. If it's very good, oh, it's going to make your thing uh, faster. But if it's lower, it's not going to actually make. Notice that this one here is the average. In other words, if all of these things, if you have an average product complexity, then you just multiply it by one and it has no effect. Now, after you calculate all these answers to all these questions, whether it's high, low, or very high, very low, or average, you then calculate this EAF that we talked about. Here, remember the EAF is this thing. So what is the EAF? It's the simple, it's the multiplicated product of all of those numbers. So it'll be 1.17 times one point, you know, whatever, times all those numbers that I took from this table, I will then multiply them together all for each one. I can only choose one for each category. And, you know, I'll get some number, which will be around one. Maybe it'll be a little bit higher, a little bit lower. And that will be my EAF. So now I have another calculator, which is the more complicated calculator, which has all those parameters in it. Notice that it has like project attributes, tools, is normal, normal, could it be normal, could it be high, low, et cetera. So I can calculate it with this calculator, but you should do it by hand. Okay, so let's take an example. I skipped over some tables, but we're gonna to get to them in a minute. I skipped them over because it's hard to explain them without doing an example. So here, Missima, our objective. You make a Gantt chart to show, a Gantt chart, by the way, is a chart that looks like this. I don't know if you made Gantt charts before. A Gantt chart looks like this, shows, progress over time, progress over time. Um, so here's our, our challenge. Make a Gantt chart that shows the time uh, and the human uh, you know, effort, I mean, how many people you need, how many, how, much, how many actual people you're gonna need over time because remember, the amount of people you need, we're about to explain this now, but the amount of people you need over time might change. <clears throat> in other words, there are different stages <clears throat> in project development. There's the analyst analysis stage, I don't need any programmers. And in the programming stage, I don't need any analysts. So I might have, those, pro, those analysts may go on to some other project when I'm finished analyzing this project. So, okay. Ramsud Gantt chart, it has man beta koch adam, and idrash al pi modo kokomo, kol shlave apikos. So for each stage of development, show how many people, how much people and time you need to do this project, to do a project. And it's going to be a marechet, it's going to be a system for health, for uh, medical. Um, uh, uh, 
medical observation, medical um, supervision, some kind of medical thing, some kind of medical system. I guess like you got your guy in the bed and it's checking all of his, you know, his, his um, you know, what the computers are showing about him, about his current state. And it's calculating what you need to do. You know, it's, it's observing him. Maybe it'll tell the nurse that he needs more vitamins. I don't know. And it's going to have it here. We're given as a given 150,000 lines of code. So that's 150 clock kilo lines of code. And we're given, okay, we're given the EAF. Because, you know, okay, we're given the EAF. The EAF that we talked about is 1.7. So we're given that. So we're not going to calculate the EAF because that's pretty simple anyway. So here's the answer. So we're going to say this is an embedded system. In other words, <clears throat> this is a classic embedded system. It's going to work with particular hardware, you know, blood pressure monitoring heart, uh, hardware, breathing measuring hardware. It's going to work, it's going to integrate with hardware and it's gonna require, you know, I don't know, a lot of work. So 100, um, why? Because it has to deal with these signals that are coming from the patient and re respond in real time. So it's kind of like a, if you think about it, it's like a pilot, it's like a system for managing a airplane uh, because, you know, it's getting signals. The wind pressure is like this and the, you know, the visibility is like this. So it's giving the height altitude. Is like, it's getting all kinds of input and it has to deal with it immediately. You can't do it in batch mode. So this is the similar kind of thing. So it's like, it's, it's an embedded system, like it's a system embedded in an airplane. And it's large. Why? Because 150,000 is close to 128,000 and far, very far from 512,000. Now, what is he talking about? So if you remember, you have to go back up here. <clears throat> up, up, up. Yeah, no, actually better. Oh no. Where did he get that number? Here, he got it from this table. Look at this table. This is the table we skipped. Are you guys still there? Yeah. 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 Okay. Isaac, you there? Are any of us really here? I'm here. Yeah, okay. Are, well, people, that's a good question. So here it says large. When it says 128 there, what it means is clock, kilo lines of code. So small would be 2,000 lines. Intermediate would be 8,000 lines. And 32 would be medium. So ours is 150,000. So that's close to large. It's not really very large. So it's large. That's the first thing that they said. We're going to slowly understand this table as we do this example. So that's the first thing they say. It's large because 150 is close to 128 and not so close to 500. So now we're going to calculate the effort, the general effort. So effort equals 3.6. Where did you get 3.6 from? Because embedded, if it's an embedded system, our A is 3.6. That's all there is to it. If once we decided that it's an embedded system, it's 3.6. And then it's going to be times 150,000 raised to what power? Well, raised to 101.2. Let's see if that's what he does. Raised to the power of 1.2. And then he also multiplies it by 1.7. Anybody tell me why he did that? No. You should know. That's the uh, EAF that exactly. uh, they gave us. Exactly. They gave us an EAF of 1.7 over here. EAF 1.7. 
So we multiplied it by 1.7. So we got the EAF, <clears throat> we got the, the coefficient and the power, and we got this number, which is Mamats Klali, they call it effort. In, ma in man months. But man months, is, we want to now find out how much time it's going to take. If it's that many man months, how much time is going to take? So we simply go back to that table. Where was it? <clears throat> and we see that C and D are 2.5 and 0.32. So let's see if we use them. Two point five and point three two, and we take our number and we multiply it out, and we get thirty and a half months. So now we can go back and say, well, if the total effort was two thousand five hundred man months, notice the units is man month, and this is three thirty divided point five months so if you have man months divided by months the months cancel each other out and you're left with mans or men so the by based on the units my, my physics teacher in high school always told me that you can know if you got the right answer if you keep your units correct your units should cancel you don't just cancel out the numbers you cancel out the units and then you should get if the, the answer you get should be in the right units so we have men, we have men and how much is it? 81 men. Of course, you can't hire 81.8 men, so you'll hire 82 men or women or alien creatures or, or people who have identity issues. Um, yeah, that's what they should call it. I have identity issues. That puts the, onus, that puts the burden on the other party. Um, 82. So... 82 people. So we're done. Oh, no, we're not done. Because the question was, show the different stages in the development of the project. Not just how many people and how... Now we know it's going to take 32 months. It's going to take like two and a half years to do this project. Right? And <clears throat> it's going to take 82 people. But we don't know we, how many people at each stage of the process. And we also don't know how long each process, each part of the process, knows each stage will take. So we want to, but we do want to be able to know that. That's the question in order to make our Gantt chart. Our Gantt chart is going to show the different stages. This is the first stage, second stage, third stage, fourth. So we're going to do this. <clears throat> Let's, um, can you see all this? Is it, should I make it bigger? No, we can see. We can see. I just can't see. Um, no, I, I would like it bigger if it's possible. Oh, you're on your phone. Yeah. Uh, view. What if I go to view? Oh, I can just go like that. What happens if I just? You can also why don't, why don't you, wait. Why don't you present it, like slideshow? Yeah. Slideshow. Yeah, but I it's all there. Slideshow. But then I don't know what to click here. Why does it say slideshow yeah. and then you have to still click slideshow, and then you still have to click? I don't know. No, 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 no. Do from current slide. Second what? to select. No slideshow. Yeah, and then two, two from the left. No, 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 no. Oh, from yeah, yeah. Side. Thank you. I'm not very good at reading all the instructions, you know. I'm just, but I expect you guys to read all the instructions. Okay, so what are we going to do here? So the first slide. Let's just. I'm just going to look at the solution and figure out how to do this. Uh, the, the steps of development. So the first step is nituach. Well, here I'll teach you Hebrew. Nituach is analysis. Nituach drishot tochna. Analysis of the requirements of the program. Re so requirements analysis, it's called. Uh, how long is that going to take? So it's going to take 200. Well, what was the 200? The 200 was, what's 200? No, no, no. First, we start here. We take our, I forgot it's in Hebrew. We take our 2,500, which is what we got over here, 2,500. That's our man months. 
And we take our 2,500 and we multiply it by 8%. And we get 200. So in other words, we're saying 8% of the man months are going to be on analysis. In other words, 8% of our effort will be on just analysis. How did I get that 8%? I just made it up. So the answer is, I didn't make it up. Somebody else made it up. It's over in this table. So if you look at this table, now we can understand this table. We said that our project is large. And we said that it's not organic, not semi-detached, semi but it's embedded. So the dark green here is what it is. And in an embedded system, Drishot is, is the first part, which means um, you can tell the order is what tells you. Drishot means uh, syst uh, requirements analysis. The requirements. Drishot means requirements. So requirements analysis is 8%. That's what that eight means, it means 8%. So we're just gonna multiply our total amount by 8%. Now that makes very good sense when we have the next stage is, you know, general design, tech and owl, is it super, uh, oh, uh, what do you say? Um, overall design maybe. And then we have tichnut, we have tichnut alif, tichnut alif and tichnut bet. Tichnut alif is, um, making the design, you know, the, the, the specific design, not just the general design. And then here's the actual kidud, actual coding and unit testing. Unit testing means testing each section, making sure it doesn't have bugs. And then the last stage is integration. So these are all the stages. Now, if you look it up, we add up all these numbers and we should get a hundred, right? 100% of the energy that we had to do. Can somebody add it up? Let's see if we get a hundred here. Daniel Klein, add this up. What's eight and 18? It, it doesn't go to 100. 26. What? Are we eight, doing eight and 18, 26. 26? Well, this is 26 and this is 26. 46, 30, uh, 52, plus another 28 is 50, 60, 70, 80. 80 plus two is 108. 108. Altogether. So that, that's why every project is over is over time. It requires 108 percent of the of the amount that it requires. Well, that doesn't make sense, though. It can't be that if we're planning it, it has to fit to 100 percent. So, if we top, chopped off this first eight percent, then we would actually get 100, right? It was 108. So, actually, these four add up to be 100 percent. Always, these four add up 100. percent They only tell you to give 110 percent. So don't we have a little leeway? So we're a little bit. We only have to go 108 percent here. So it's fine. We're off by two percent. You have to uh, always give 110. Okay, so we're going to really figure out how this works. It works in a very strange way because they just did this math. They just a little bit mathematical confusion because they just they tried to figure out how the numbers are going to work, and it came out like this. So, so it's like this. 8% of the first one. And then each, the next one, if you know, let's memorize the numbers here for a second. 8%. By the way, this is pilug mamats, which means the division of effort, how the effort should be. That's why we were talking about the whole man month thing, because that's the effort. The 2,500 is the effort. So we're dividing up that 2,500 because this is the effort one. The next table here, which I didn't get to yet, is the time, how the time will be divided. up. This is just how the effort will be divided up. So it's 8%, let's remember this, 8, 18, 25, 26, 31. Now let's go back to the solution here. 8, 18, 25, 26, 31. Those are those numbers. Now what they did is like this. The first is gonna take 8% of the time. Then what they say is like this, of the, the 18 doesn't really mean 18. It means 18 of the remaining time, of the remaining effort. So we only have, if we used up 8% of the effort, we only have 92% left. So it's 92% times the 18 times that number. So in other words, we chopped off eight from the, from the top, 
And then whatever is left is only 92%. And then of that, we divide it up in this proportions. So now we know that the amount of effort that will be exerted in the second stage is 414 man months. And 575 man months for the Tekken, for the, for the, whatever you call it, the plan, the coding, and the integration. Now, if you notice, these names are not exactly the same as what we saw before. Well, actually, it is. It is. These are the same. It is the same. Okay. So now we've got that, but none of that appears on this table because we don't want effort. We want people and time. Time, Zman is time, and Kohadam, people. So we're going to take that general effort and we're going to create the next thing, these time. So, in order to do that, we need the other table, this table. And here is where the, the, how many were there before? If you look here, there are five stages here. Of course, there are really only four stages after the first part, but there are five stages here, starting with Nituach. Now, look at the, the problem here is with the time, there's only four stages. Why is that? Because the Drishot is the same, the Tekken Al is the same, but the Tichnut, they included, Tichnut is including in it two stages. Which two stages? The, which two stages? The, the, the detailed, the, coding. the detailed analysis, the detailed plan and the actual coding are both in the coding, in the Tichnut. So there's actually a discrepancy here, but we're going to figure that out. So first of all, let's take the numbers. We're in a large and we're in embedded. So it's 36 for, every, 36 for the first four and 28 for the last one. For the first three, sorry, for the first three. So look what we do in the answer. We say... 36 for the first one, 36, 36, 36, 28. So we got the 28 at the end and the 36 at the beginning, but we have an extra, but we'll see how that works. So basically what we do is the same thing we did over here. We say 36 times the, um, times the Chodeshim. Well, the Chodeshim was 30. Remember we got that? We got the 30 and a half here. 30 and a half months. So since we're doing time now, we're going to use that number. So 36% of the 30 is 11 months. I mean, just gee whiz, that's going to take us a, almost a year to plan this software. Out. That's what it's saying. We're basically using this idea of, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a big company, a big, you know, big industry, you know, before they start, they're going to plan it. And they're going to spend a whole year planning it. Then the general design is going to take 36% of what's left again. 36 was from the top. So what's left? 64%. 64% is for the whole, all the actual work. So of, we're going to multiply 64% times that 36% that we had before. For... Remember, it was 36, 36, everything was 36 except the last one was 28. So 36% of 74 times that same amount of time that we thought, which was 30 and a half months. So we're going to get seven months. And the same thing, oh, my connection is unstable. The 36 here, again, by the 64, and the 28 by the 64, and by the same number, and we get this. But if you notice, we have an extra 36. So actually what happened is these two, the Tekken Al and the Kidud, the, 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 the Tekken Miforat, the, the detailed plan and the coding are combined in this table. Where, were that? Where was that table? Yeah. 
because they're just called programming. So we have to separate them out. How are we going to separate them out? Because we're going to say like this. We're going to look over here and say, this one has all of them separated out. And how are they separated out? 25 went for the first part and 26 for the second, for the, the actual programming um, is 26% and 25% for that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the ratio of that. We're gonna take 25 over 26. In other words, of the 36 here, about half of it is going to go for one and half of it's going to go for the other, right? One half of it's of the technique is going to go for Tekkenal and half of it, I'm sorry, for Tekken Mifarat for the detailed plan, and half of it's going to go for the actual coding. But but um not exactly half. Because if you notice that we're gonna we want to keep maintaining this ratio. And in this ratio, it's 25 to 20, if it'll be 25, 25, it'll be exactly half and half. But it's 25, 26. So look what they do in the solution here. I do 25 out of the total, 25 plus 26. Well, 25 and 25 is 50. So 25 plus 26 is 51. So 25 out of the total, that percent is about half of the 36 is for the particular part called the detailed plan. And the 26 out of 51, not 25, 26, because that's the second part, out of the 51 is for the actual coding. So now I've got all the different parts for Zman. So now I know the Zman is going to be my starting point, really, because now I have the Zman. Once I have the Zman, I can divide the total man months by the, Zman, by the time, and I can get how many people I need. So I'm gonna need 18 people here. I'm gonna need, I had 414 man months divided by seven is the time, seven months. So we get 58.8. .8. And so you'll see that for the first year, if you think about it, for the first almost year, I'm gonna only need 18 and a quarter people or whatever. I'm gonna need 19 people. Can't have a quarter person. So I'm gonna need 19 people. And then for the next seven months, I'm gonna need 58 people, then it's going to go way up to 160 people, 160, and then down to 130. So we're going to write this in a Gantt chart. So we do like this. 18, we can't have 18.12, so it's 19 people. So in the beginning, 11, these are the months, 11 months. <laughs> Starts off, we have 19 people. And we're in stage one. Then it goes down to, by the way, I wonder if, if there's any reason not to do it. The other way, you know, start off low. Why wouldn't you write 19 down here? Anyway, 19 people <clears throat> for the first 11 months. Then for the next seven months, 7.04 months, we're gonna have 59 people because 58, then we're going to go up to 100 and then we're going to, then the next stage is going to be from 18. How do, where's this 18.0? This 18.04 is 11, is the 11 over here plus the 704. In other words, this is not, the, I'm adding, this is month 18. So month 18, it starts at month 11. <clears throat> That's the general plan. And then by 18th month, I should already be finished with the general plan and I should be at the uh, detailed plan. And then at month 21, I should be, at month 21, I should be at the programming. And at month 25, I should be at the integration. So this is how people are able to say things that like, our, prog our program is on schedule, or our program is a month behind schedule. How do, how, where do they, how do they have any idea what the schedule should be for some software program? So they have it by doing this. Now, 
you could argue with this and say like you just you know i mean what's nice about this is that it's that you have that you have numbers in other words we can show you the method of how we got where we got in other words we could be wrong it's like the same thing with like predicting the economy i can show you why i you know what methods i use to what statistical analysis i use to make this prediction and i have even numbers it makes it look very real but of course then there is the prediction is only as good as the numbers that I have. Was it really a thousand five hundred, uh, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand lines of code? Maybe it will be more. Maybe it'll be less. Was it really? Was my program? Or was my EAF really one point seven? So garbage in, garbage out. Your data, your results here are only as as believable as the data that you put in was. Anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll definitely have a question on your exam that requires you to do something like this. I, I have a question. Yes. The 82 people that we calculated before we did all this, is that just the average of the people we need? Or because we here we see we need 59 and sometimes 167. Is the 82 just the average of all of that? Excellent question. Also, Chodoshim, well, Chodoshim is 30. Let's see. Is it 30? Let me start before you get there. Let me see. Is it 30? Yeah, it is 30. Look, the Chodoshim worked out. Um, you're right. The 80, the Chodoshim, the, the month worked out to be exactly what we said. But it seems to me, where, where yeah, it seems to me that this 80 people, this 82 people, is um it's writing over there in the average where to say ah koch adam ah you're right it says average yes it's the average so it's the average so i don't know so how do you do an average of such a thing of such a gantt chart well i guess you you do a weighted average because for a, a large percentage of the time you're going to have only 19 people so that, in other words, you don't just add these numbers and do an average. You add these numbers, you first multiply them by the amount of months. This is 819 times 11. This is 59 times seven. This is 160 times only, you know, only three here. So it's a weighted average and you'll get 82 apparently, yeah. Well, it makes sense because we, we started with the 82 and then we divided it up by those by those things so yes it's uh it's the average excellent question um all right let me stop that so we did kokomo and we are Where, oh, here we go. I think we finished slides two. Isn't that correct? I'll look at it again for a second. I think we did it. Maybe. Not, I don't know if we did all of it. Yeah, we did. Yeah, then we did do it. Is the cost analysis? Let's look at the Kokomo uh, slides. Yeah, so Kokomo is really part of two. Now let's go to three. Okay, we're learning something new now. Now we're learning another, we're learning a, a method of um, of diagramming. Now this method is an old method. Uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know if it's any more, I don't know, I mean, I don't, for sure, I don't know. I don't know how much any of these things are in use. I'm not, you know, I'm not a system designer really, and I don't work, I didn't interview a lot of people who work in the field, but, uh, DFDs were very popular for many, many years. I'm not sure if they're still so popular or still being used, but you will have it. You will have to learn it, and it is useful because it gives you a method of defining a system. If there is a, if if it's been replaced, it's been replaced by something similar. Um, it's not in UML. That's my main point. DFDs are not in UML, but let's learn information system. So, okay. 
First, I'm going to give you some introduction, and then we're going to see how to do these DSPs. A computer information system is a system composed of people and computers that processes or interprets information, data. The term also sometimes is also sometimes used to simply refer to a computer system with software installed. Now, there's any computer system is an information system also. This is to be distinguished from real-time computer systems. In other words, real-time systems are not information systems. They're real-time systems. Real-time systems are, like my classic example is like, you know, a missile system, uh, a jet, a, a computer on a jet, uh, even a computer that runs, a, runs machines in a factory, you know, robots that put cars together um, are run by a real-time computer system. That's the opposite of an information system. You know, I'm thinking now to myself, what is a, a web app? Is a web app an information system or a real-time system? I mean, it works in real time, but it's really more of an information system. You're just asking for information and it's fine. information applying. system works in real time, no? Yeah, every information system works in real time. Well, Isn't the main difference whether or not, like how things fail and what's prioritized over the queue? Yes, the general definition of real-time system is that it has, it has severe constraints on the time for the execution of an act of of a, of a of a process. In other words, there are there are strict restraints for when it should finish. A uh, that's what we said in operating systems. In other words, um, like a missile system, no sense in calculating how the missile should shoot and fi figuring it out by the you know a year from now. You got to know right now. You got to know before you shoot it. You got to know when. A missile guidance system when it's running in the you got to calculate how what to do actually i did i tell you this like if you're calculating a missile guidance system the missile's in the air and it says oh no a huge amount the wind has changed i've got to calculate you know what i should do now but the time it takes me to calculate is going to be three seconds in three seconds i'll be three seconds forward in the air so i got to know what change to make not now but what change to make in three seconds what if I make that calculation and it turns out it was five seconds? Well, my calculation is worthless. I got to do it again. So I have a hard constraint on how much time, if I decided that I'm going to calculate where I need to be in three seconds, it's gotta, I got to do it, right? If I do it in five seconds, it's worthless. So that's a real-time system. So yes, a, a web application would be an information system. Um, and Information system, IS, is composed of hardware, software, data. Obviously, I have data. Procedures, what to do with the data. In other words, or well, procedure, yeah, procedures are like how to use the system. People who use the system and feedback. If there's a failure, if information is not good. Another view, I'm just describing information systems is an information system composed of hardware, software, database, network, and procedures. I prefer the first sent. I prefer the first since it is, since it emphasizes that people are also an element of any system. Right, I like this one. Because the system has to have people in it. You have to take account of what the people are gonna do. Okay, whatever, that's just definitions. Uh, systems analysis. Now we're defining what systems analysis is. So there's different kinds of systems analysis. There's systems analysis that's nothing to do with computers. You could just ana analyze the system that the army has for promoting generals, you know, promoting people or, or how the system, how the army works. But the development of a computer-based information system includes a system analysis phase. This helps produce the data model, a precursor to creating or enhancing a database. In other words, we have some kind of data model. What data are we gonna want to have how are we going to want to organize it? And then we'll actually create the database. I mean, database design is a whole field, right? There are programmers who decide to become a database manager you know, or a database person. All he does all day long is, main, is, is, is design databases or write queries for the databases. A systems analysis, so, but you have to design how your data is going to be. A system analysis, also known as a 
business technology analysis. Business technology analyst is an information technology professional, an IT professional, who specializes in analyzing, designing, and implementing information systems. Okay, that makes sense. We see that the flow of data in a system is the main focus when planning a system. Right, we want to see how the data flows. This is, it's like, I don't know if you ever heard this expression, like when the, when the police are investigating a crime, sometimes they say, or in some movies they say, follow the money. Right, if you follow the money, you'll know who where the money ended, then he's the guy who probably ordered the assassination or whatever, he ordered the crime. Follow the money. So in a, when we're analyzing a system, let's say somebody comes and they says, I got this computer system and it just doesn't work well. Can you write, can you fix it? So how do you start? So one way you start is by following the data. In other words, figure out what data goes where, what data, what process sends data to what other process, or if it's a human system, what forms are filled out, what, what, where do those forms go? And you can start to understand how the system works if you just follow all the data. What, who's passing data to whom? What are they doing with the data? And where are they passing it to? And then I can start to see the flow of how the system works. And that's what we're talking about, a data flow diagram. If you want to analyze a, an existing system, you want to follow the money. You want to follow the data. How the data moves through the system will tell you what the system is doing and how it works. Because it very, you know, happens that, you know, the people who design the systems are, are have, have quit and are working somewhere else. And nobody, and everyone knows their little part, and nobody knows how the whole system works. And a big system, that definitely could happen. But nobody knows anymore how the system works because all those people, my wife actually is working at a company where it was bought out by another company. And slowly over the past two years, everybody has quit. And now her boss is not, now she quit. And now her boss quit. So I don't think there's anybody in the company that knows how the system works. There's just like the low level programmers, but nobody actually knows how the system works anymore. So they may need to hire somebody to come in and analyze the system because they hired, they bought this computer program and they're going to try to sell it and they can try to improve it. And all the workers who built it when it was a startup have left. And the company that bought the startup has the software but has nobody who knows how it's built. So they need a system analyst to come in and figure out what's going on, if they're gonna ever have any hope of, of, you know, I mean, hopefully, because it was a startup, they didn't have any planning. They didn't have a diagrams of how the system works. Nobody made them. And now this company, you know, bought them, paid a lot of money, you know, and it's almost worthless if you think about it. What's the use of a system that you don't know how it works? So they need a, system analyst to come in okay so if once we've established that you want to follow the data we're going to make a data flow diagram since the data of central importance to any information system because the data is information and that's what it is we need a way to plan out the use and manipulation of this data a data flow diagram is one way to create a diagram and plan for how the data moves around and is used and changed in the system. So this is one way, there's different ways, but this is one way. What are the components of a DFD? The computer functions, or is the processes inside the computer, the inputs, the outputs, and the databases. When I say databases or data stores, what I mean is tables in the data. If you've learned, if you've learned um, databases already, then have you guys learned databases? Some of us, yes, some of us, no. Okay. Well, it's a good subject to learn in school at some point. Uh, SQLs, and you learned the main thing that you're supposed to learn really is how to design how to design tables, what tables you should have, not to have double, not to have repeat, repeated information of every piece of data just once. Unless it's, I mean, except for backups, but but every data should be represented once. And so when we talk about data stores or databases, what we really mean is tables in a data, in a database. Each table we're considering like a new database. So, okay, so again, it's going to have computer functions, inputs, outputs, and data stores. Let me go to... Um, yeah.
So there's the gain and sarsen notation, a non-hierarchical DFD. This is not the way we're going to do it, but I'm just showing it to you. This is you might see a database like this. I mean, a, a DFD like this, and what it shows you here is, um, here the sales department. It sends data to the Department of Production Management and Control. And what does it send? It sends sales schedule or an order amendment or work order. The sales department can send all those things here. So this shows you the lines show you where what data is going from what's from what depart department can be two things. It can either be if you're defining a system that's not computerized. So then the department is actually just like the, the that that you know the the floor in the office building that deals with that, the people that deal with that. But it can also be the software that deals with that, the, the class or the set of functions that deal with sales. And here you have a database, product inventory file, production data. These are these are databases or, or, or what we would really call um, tables that has in it the uh, product inventory. If I want to check product availability, I need to check against the database to see if it's available, if I have that product. Now the arrows pointing in two directions means that I can that I can put data into it and I can take data out of it. Here, for example, the sales department, he only sends things to the department of production. Production never sends anything to the sales department. When they do something, they may modify the database. And then I will check the database periodically, but they never send me anything directly. Um, that's a certain kind of database, a certain kind of DFD. Um, this is this is the DeMarco notation of a DFD. So again, this is the gain and Sarsen notation. This is the DeMarco notation, and we're going to focus on this one really. Now, what this says is like this. First of all, it gives numbers, one, two, three. And it says, um, well, this is for example, uh, of, you know, you guys know what Blockbuster Video is? There used to be such a thing where you could rent DVDs or videos. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you've heard of it, but you've probably never seen it. I've been there one and I had a Blockbuster card. You had a blockbuster card. When did you, really? I thought they're, I thought they're twenty years already don't exist. What twenty years? Like fifth? Look when uh, Netflix was uh, started. All right, I don't know. I think it's been dead for maybe like 10, 15 years. Okay, so you can loan a video. You so loan a video. So what are all the things that a customer can do? We're not going to do it again. This is not exactly the way we're going to do it, but. General idea. He can return a video. He can he can put a membership. He can give the information from a membership card. He can be given an overdue reminder. He can be given a video loan. General idea is like that. Uh, customer details are in a customer file, right? You have a file for on each customer, and then the customer details can go to loan because I might want to know. Maybe I'm not going to lend him any because he already got too many out, or I don't know. Maybe he owes me money. I has to pay before he can lend him another one. And then we have create new customer. So create new customer. That's easy. Customer details gets a membership card. And it's information. A membership card doesn't mean a physical thing. What it means is he membership card. Yeah, you know, they always write it like that. It's confusing to people because we're not describing physical movement. We're describing data. So what data does he get? So a membership card has a membership ID number. So essentially it means it really shouldn't be membership card. It should be member ID number. That's the data he gets. And also this, what does it mean? Video loan. It's not, we, don't, we don't describe the actual video changing hands. Maybe we write the number of the, maybe he gets a, a number with the receipt that says you have, you have taken video number seven. These lines are only describing data, numbers. 
numbers that are moving back and forth, not physical. Why does the items. customer? Why does the customer have two blocks? Is that separate? Would that be separate? That's an excellent question because it's an important point. Yes, the same. The, well, what do I mean? This is not the same as this. Oh, here. Ah, that's just for convenience. That's just. Uh, you're right. Why does he have two over here? That's just because we didn't want the, the diagram to be too uh, too many lines coming from the same thing. But you're right. It, it, it could have been all one in this case. Now, sometimes what you'll see is the customer on the other side. The truth is, this is not exactly the style we're going to use. We're going to use a third style, but it's based on a DeMarco. I don't know why we don't use this style. But we're going to use a third style. Do I have it? Um, Yeah, here. This is what we're gonna look. This is our way eyes are gonna look. But just a minute. First of all, in in the ones that we're gonna learn, the actual customer is gonna go. If he receives data, he's gonna be on the other side, on the right. On the left side is for putting in data, and on the right side is for getting out. But that's not important anyway. So what I want to show you is this, though. The main point of the DeMarco notation that we're adopting is that the two here, how does this do this? How does all these processes work inside of this loan? I would call it video loan um, management system. That would be the, right? This would be stock control management system. These are all management systems. User account management system, I would call this. So, what goes on? What are the processes that goes on inside? Every circle here is a process. Every uh, shape like this with two lines is a database, and these are the these are the these are the external entities. They're outside of the system, right? The customer is outside of the system. The supplier is not part of the system. He's he's a source of data for the system, but he is not described by the system. His inner workings we don't describe. These are external sources of data. These are internal sources of data and also stores of data. And these are processes. Now, process two here has lots of things going on inside it. So we draw another DFD where we write 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, meaning inside of process two is all of these, all the processes start two point, are inside of process two. And they are processes like validate a customer, make sure it's a really a customer. Issue a video, restock a video, because he brought it back. All the things involved in restocking it, you know, marking it as here, um, checking, I don't know. Maybe we have like a, a procedure where a human being has to mark that the, that he has to test it. Has it been tested? Maybe he returned us a blank video, you know. Check it, make sure it's really the video. Maybe we have a, you have to mark off that it has been checked and it is valid. You know, maybe it's damaged. We need to buy a new one. So the, all the processes of restocking are inside of here. So the customer returns a video and we do the process of restocking it. And a part of that, we may mark off in our database that the item has been returned and it is in a valid state. It's in a you know usable state. So I have all of these stages. So, so the idea is that I don't put all of these subsystems inside of the first diagram because it would be too confusing. So I, 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 can, I make two different pages. And if I want to know how two works, I go to two. I go to the page mark two. Okay. So why we prefer the DeMarco notation because it gives you a general view and a more detailed view of each part of the system. It gives you multiple views. Well, I didn't say something, but obviously, or maybe it's not obvious, I can also define what goes on in three. I can do three, a page on three and define what goes on in here. Um, allows for greater detail without overwhelming the reader with too much information all at once. So we can, we can uh, give him a general one without too much information and then slowly give him each part. We call DF, DFD0 will contain all the functionality of the system. So DFD0 is this one, where we have all the, the top things, the whole system. 
Now this is DFD two, and it just explains what happens in two. It's gonna be a DFD one to explain what happens in one, and a DFD three to explain that. And they're all to like the second level. All three of those are at the second level. I could have a third level. If I wanted to explain all the details that happen inside of issue video, I could have a page called 2.2. .2. And in that, I would have 2.2.1, 2.2.2, 2.2.3, 2.2.4, however many I need. We will use double circles for any functionality that has lower level descriptions. So now we're going to introduce uh, a new way of doing it, which is that we write double circles like this to indicate that there's lower level explanations. A single circle will mean that's it. There's not, I mean, there is no page to describe what's happening inside. So double circles means there is more detailed DFD for that entity. For example, student management, DFD2 might contain the following sub-processes. Add student, disable student, update student details, register to course, pay fee, get grades, documents, sign up for exam. Those are all things that a student might do or that I might do for a student. The inner workings of these processes are to be described in DFT2. Okay. Tips. So here, to decide what main processes are in DFTFS, you might use the departments of the organization you have as a guide. In other words, if you have a big company, you might actually just use like, you have the, you know, the employment, you have the HR department, you have the, all the different departments, those might be processes. Because what are all the processes that HR does? Simple processes do not need to explain. They are called basic processes. So some, you don't have to explain to every level of detail. How many databases should you have? You should follow good database design rules. For example, if you have a database of books and a database of library members, you will also need a database of on loan books, which will reference the other two databases. I don't know if you learned this, but like if you have a book, if you have all kinds of information about the book in a book table, then you're going to just have index numbers for each book. Whenever you want to refer, let's say you have a database of on loan books, you're not going to write out the title and the author on that in that file, in that database. All you're going to write is the date that it was taken out and the number of the book according to the other table. And then if you want to know the details, you'll, you'll look at the other table. All right, now let's get into more details of the symbols. What are all the symbols that a DFT has? So it, like we said, it has a simple circle. It has a complex, which is a simple process, a complex process. It has an external entity or user. Could be another a human being. It could be another system. It could be that my system talks with the IRS. My, you know, because I have to update them on new, new workers and taxes that I pay. Um, data flow is an arrow. Database. Database is a rectangle, but it's usually with like a little number here where it's the database number. Here's also a number and the database name or the what I call the table name. This is a RN would be a real time entity and a timer would be a, some internal timer. A real time entity could be like um, if you know people punch in when they come to work. So that's a real time entity that you know it's a physical thing. They they put their they punch in they put their fingerprint on it. And it says that, oh, Mark has come to work at three o'clock. And that data now is a, is a real-time entity which provides data to my data system. And I can keep track of whether Mark is on time to work or not. So you draw that in a triangle. Also a timer you draw in a triangle. Borders. So in the ones we saw before, there were no borders. I mean, this one had no borders. But notice here, I did write borders. So... Every DFD diagram should have a border around it. The physical entities that interact with the system are drawn outside the borders. Any external entity on the left of the diagram is input data. 
And the external entity on the right is receiving data. That's what I said to you. And they we're not going to do it the way they did in the other diagrams. We're going to have right and left. So you may have the same entity on the right and the left because he's also putting data in and also receiving data. An external entity can appear several times in the diagram. We need to do this if, the, if that entity inputs and receives data. An external entity can appear several times. Right, we said that. We also might put an entity twice on the same side if we want to cut down on the, on the length of some arrows. Right, because I think I have an example of this. Yeah, you see, I might have this same box E1 further down because he's going to use some system down here. And if I want him to use this and this, I don't want to draw an arrow all the way from here to here. I might just write E1 again and put him here. So shorter arrow. So let's look at this picture again. So here you have a, a DFD. And notice I have, what does this mean, circle mean? Somebody tell me, what does this circle mean? Just the fact that it's a simple circle? A process. Process, and what kind of process? Simple. Yeah, or a basic process. What is this one? That's complex. Complex process, yes. What is D2? Database. Database, very good. What data, I mean, who is reading, who is, all right. What is uh, E1? Extended entity. Not extended, ex external. External, sorry. External entity, what is he doing? Is he receiving data or inputting data? Both. Inputting. Inputting. Oh, wait, somebody said both. No. On, the, on the left side, he's inputting, but look on the right. There's E1 again. So he's both. What about E3? Only out. Why does he appear twice on the right side? Because it would look ugly if they were connected. Exactly. Because it would look ugly if you had a line all the way up to the top. They wrote it again. But it's not a different entity. Who is, now here's a hard question. Who is reading data from D2? Uh, that for function D, however you read that. Yes, for function, function, function D, which is number four. Yes, exactly. And who's writing to database two? To function D. Right. Um, sorry, I've been teaching. Today is a crazy day. I don't know why the head of the department gave me to teach from 8.30 in the morning till 7.30 at night. Well, we could have a break sometime. Yeah, we could have a break. Um, all right, let's have a break right now. Till when? Um, till 53, 10 minutes. Okay. So I'll stop the share. I'll stop the, re I'll pause. Recording has started. Sharing screen has started i think now okay so i think you guys understand this diagram um even though without understanding the hebrew i mean the hebrew just just general stuff but here you see by the way a timing in what's, what's here's the a, bottom line this yeah that's a timer that's a, a timing device it means like at, at 12 o'clock at midnight, we do whatever this function is every once a day or once a week. It's some kind of timer that tells the system to do some action. So that's why it's like sort of semi-external, but it's also um, an input because it's inputting, telling us to do something. Also, this is an external device, some kind of, uh, I'm writing, you know, it could be, I'm writing to some kind of uh, device here. <clears throat> Okay. What did we say? Right. Okay. 
So here we are, rules about processes and DFDs. There is a hierarchical relationship between process and subprocesses, going from complex to basic. In other words, <clears throat> th this will have basic processes inside of it. Well, this one won't, because there's no lines. This one has the double lines, is going to have a it's complex, it'll have basic processes inside it. That's a hierarchy. Each process has a unique ID number. The process name does not have to be unique, but the ID number does have to be unique. Although I've never, I would not recommend and never seen any things with processes that are the same names. But well, I guess theoretically, inside of two different uh, process, major processes, you might have two basic processes which are the same name. That could be. Uh, complex processes are usually named, but the numbers would even then be different. Complex processes are usually usually named with nouns, whereas basic processes are verbs in the command form, like run, you know, diagnostic, or, you know, I don't know, calculate this. That would be the basic process. And the complex processes are usually nouns like user management, right? Inside of user management, there's lots of processes. You wouldn't write like manage users because that's not an action. There's no action called manage users. User management is, is, Muted, professor. I know I muted myself because I have to tell my son to do something. Um, okay, so right, it makes sense that complex processes are named with nouns because, like we're saying, inside of it would be the. It wouldn't make sense to say manage users. What 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 is that action? It's not clear what that action is. So ma user management for a complex, and the basic ones would be like you know, assign user new ID number. That would be a, would be a command. Every, you don't have to explain how you're going to assign him a new user number. Every process must have at least one input data and one output data. You can't have a process that doesn't have input and output of data. You know, you're just going to put it into the process and then the, how will I know the process ever did anything if it doesn't give me some data? Every process must have input and output. Those. More rules about processes. You don't need to list super obvious processes, like how to update a username, or like you know how, what are you going to do? To, you don't even need to list how that process, changing the name from you know Nick to Nicholas or something, or how to check if a password is correct. You don't have to explain that. Too much detail detracts or distracts. A process cannot have a data flow into itself. No recursion. No, this process doesn't feed itself data. You don't draw it. If it does, you don't draw it. Every DFD should have between four and 11 processes. In other words, every page of a DFD. Shouldn't have a, a DFD with just like one process on it. It's not really makes sense. Uh, rules about databases. So we have databases in our thing. Data is created by system processes. Right. In other words, some process is going to end up writing data to a database. It's going to create the data. I mean, the process creates it. Of course, there might be an input to the process, like where it gets data from. Identified by a D followed by a serial number, right? So every database we saw that has to have the letter D. There needs to be at least one function that updates data, that should be data, that updates data and one that reads the data. In other words, you're not going to have a database that doesn't have a reader and a writer. It doesn't have to be the same process. See, here I have different processes reading and writing. Well, actually, this uh, seems to be a mistake. How could it just be reading from the data? How did this data get written to? Who wrote it? Ah. Well, it's not a mistake because that's D1 is the same as this D1. So somebody did write to it. Actually, there's a convention that you write a little line here to, indicate, to indicate that it's a second one. I don't know why we do that for databases and we don't do it for these entities. You know, 
but whatever. Oh, maybe because, well, I don't know. Don't know why. Reading is, yeah, I wrote this pretty fast, you see. Reading is shown by an arrow pointing away from the database. Writing is shown by an arrow pointing to the database. Let me figure that out. All contact with the database must, must be by a process. For example, one database cannot read or write to another database. That's an important point. You can only access the databases through a process. You can't have a database with an arrow to another database or a person with an you know outside an, a, a customer you know whatever person with an arrow pointing to a database always goes through a process um all content with the database where we said that when the same database appears twice put a diagonal line we said that an external database one we are not responsible for creating and which exists on some external system should obviously be shown outside the borders of the system either on the left if we're reading from it or on the right if we're writing to it. So you could have a process writing to a database that's outside. Um, although usually you wouldn't do that. Usually you would write the name of the system and you say, I'm writing to this system, you know, to the IRS system or something. Tips about databases. You don't realize what a good job I did here of organizing this information. Tips about data. Never delete a database from a database. Never delete data from, oh, this is my own addition here. In other words, from my experience in programming, a lot of people think, oh, well, I no longer, you know, sell kumquats on my site. Let's just delete that uh, entry from my table. Why clog it up with these foods that I no longer, no longer serve? Don't do that. Just disable it which means that you might need to have on every piece of data enabled or disabled, you know, as a flag. You might need reports of history. You might wanna know for, you might get audited by the tax department. You might, you might wanna know how many kumquats did you sell last year? If you don't have kumquats in your diction, in your database anymore, then you'll never, then, it, then you, it'll be hard, you won't be able to show that. The data may be referenced by other data by means of indexes. In other words, I may have a, a receipt for somebody that is stored in my, and that receipt says on it, he bought six cucumbers and three kumquats. So if I delete kumquats, I will just have a number there. And I won't have the actual word kumquat, I'll just have the number of it. And I'll go to that find that ID and it won't exist. And my database will give me an error. It's an unmatched ID. Or even worse, it'll give me a new entry which has that ID number. Now cucumbers, now uh, watermelons have that number. And so it'll look like he bought watermelons. So you never delete anything. Deleting will cause the reference to be invalid. You just mark it as disabled or no longer available or whatever. When we show databases, we really mean tables. I told you that. Do we show all the databases in the DFT office? That's an interesting question. What if there's a database that we only use in DFD2? You know, in 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 a particular sub process, in a sub process we use. So the answer is we show only the databases that are used by more than one process. Databases in turn to a particular process will be shown in a lower down database, in a lower down DFD, assuming that it's a complex process. In other words, as far as I know, this process uses Another database, it's just not written here. When I go and look at DFT5, I will see what processes, what databases it uses. Only reason I, so this is actually, the only reason, if you notice, all these databases are used by more than one process. That's why they're here. If this is, if he would write and, if he would read and write to the same database, and that's all he did, if he reads and writes to his own personal database, then I wouldn't write it here. It's just something that, I mean, it's a complicated question. I might, well, presum presumably then this will be a complex process and then I'll define it when I define this. That's basically the idea. Um,
rules for external entity or a user. So he can be an employee or not an employee. Here's an important point. You the, 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 in other words, the name should be the role that the person is playing, not you know, the job title, not um, the particular person, obviously, not like Mark, but what Mark's job is, or the, but it's more than that, not just manager, because Mark could have different roles. He could be the manager, but he could sometimes, when somebody calls in sick, he's the sales clerk. So I don't write that the manager can also check sale items because when Mark is selling items, he's in the role of sales clerk. You see what I mean? He, he's not selling items as the manager now, he's selling it, at, even though he is the manager, his role is a sales clerk. Now it could be that a manager, as a manager can sell, that, that's a system. Now there's a system might say, no, he has to log out as manager and log in again as a worker because only workers are allowed to sell. Depends how the system has worked. You could have a system that where, in other words, the role, it's not the person, but it's the role that they're playing that is, the, that is what you write in the DFT. Um, receive, this is external entity user. I think the next one is external entity, time external entity, see. Um, the, re, re, it receives an ID number preceded by the letter E, okay. Is not part of the system, appears outside the system, left or right. The user is the person supplying the data. This is also an important point, five here. It's the person supplying the data or receiving the data, not the secretary or technician who does the actual typing. In other words, if I go to, this is an important point, if I go to a, if I want to create a new user uh, for my, you know, a new uh, member of my, uh, you know, I don't know, the Gap store has membership, let's say. And a person can say, I'm not a member, I want to become a member. So the sales clerk will say, okay, what's your name? What's your ID? What's your phone number? You know, and she'll type in all that information. Who do we write as the user of the system? So we actually write client. That's what it's saying here, because he's the source of the data. The data is coming. Not the, it's not that the that the that the sales clerk is inventing this person. This person is giving the data. Even though this person never t touches the system with his fingers, it's a subtle point. All human interaction, all all human interaction with the system must be described. Yeah, so you have to describe all the ways the system can be used. You can't just describe some of it. You have to describe everything. It is permitted to combine roles into a single role and then separate them out into child DFTs. For example, in your DFT FS, you might have a customer, which we'll call E1. But in DFD1, you might have a retail customer, and you might have, two, or a, and you might have wholesale customer and VIP customer, and you'll call them in, in this way, E1.1, because he's part of one, really. So it's like inheritance. An event is gen uh, external time entity. An event is generated not by a user of the system, but by the system itself at a pre-appointed time. So an external time entity means that like I said, a clock or something that says, okay, now it's time to do process X. For example, the end of the day, the end of the month or on the, a certain date, do something. Always appears on the left side because it's an input, obviously. Whereas uh, real-time entities can appear on either side. In DFD zero, time entities are not numbered. Okay. Real-time is usually either a sensor or a device. Um, here I have some. This is like a watering the grass system. 
And this is a moisture measurement device for the ground, a ground moisture measurement. So he will supply data. And based on that, he'll turn on or off the watering system. Now, if you notice, I explained something else here with an or. Here, except it, it receives signals about moisture in the soil and compares them to what the norm should be, what the ideal moisture should be. And then I either do one of the following. That's what this or means. This or means I don't do this and this, which could theoretically be. If I would have no or here, the assumption would be and. I do this and this. But here I do either, based on what I decide over here, I either do, I either send um, the low moisture level reading to this process which turns on the sprinkler. And it's not just a simple process. It's, I mean, it's not just turn on the sprinkler. It might be, you know, how, what pressure to put on the sprinkler, how long, what timing to. This is, if it's too much moisture, then I go to turn off the sprinkler. Okay. Um, we have the data flow arrow. The data flowing in the direction of the arrow is called the data element. The arrow simultaneously indicates what triggers the process it points to. There's also a key point if it points to a process. So when you have arrow pointing to a process, remember an arrow can also point to a database, but if an arrow points to a process, then it also triggers the process. It makes the process start doing its thing, but it starts processing. So you can think of the arrows simultaneously as a trigger and a um, actual flow of data. Since it is impossible to write on the arrow all the data being passed, there's a data dictionary which we'll use to define all the data fields in, of each data flow. In other words, I might just write user information. And then I'll have a data dictionary where I write user information is the following thing. That's a data dictionary. Every error either starts or ends at a process symbol. You have to have, the, they have to point to a, a, a process. Wait a second, um, let me. Uh, oh, I was recording. Okay. So what did we say? So every arrow either starts or ends at a process symbol. Two data flows have the same name. We can distinguish them by the entities between which the data is flowing. In other words, you could have two things that are both called uh, you know, user information, but we could be me refer to the one that's coming from here or one that comes from there. If one of the if one of the entities the error connects to is a complex process, then we call it a complex data flow. Why, do, what does that mean? If it's coming from a complex process, that means that, that means that it's um, inside of it, it might be coming, it might be several flows. There might be several flows. It might be describing different flows that are coming from different pro sub processes. So it may be a complex flow in the sense that it has different, it represents different data flows at different times. Mistaken use of a bidirectional arrow. So a basic or fundamental process cannot be connected with a two-headed arrow, but a complex process can. In other words, if this says X, if this is like a basic thing like, like um, delete user, I can't have an arrow going both directions because what am I doing? Am I writing here or reading? What am I reading? I already. It, asks, it invites questions. What, what, what am I doing? I thought it was just one. If I just say delete user and I'm writing here, it means obviously I'm just updating the database with the fact that he, when I delete a user, by the way, like I said before, I don't delete him, I just disable him. 
So even if I call it delete user, really what I'm doing is just updating a um, field on the user that says enable or disable. Which, by the way, is going to add complexity to your system, which is good because we need to show that complexity. We need to show a little bit that you're what you're doing. But anyway, two this you can't have a double directional arrow with a simple without you know without with a, a, a fundamental process. This is obviously a complex process. The meaning of two headed arrows with a complex process. So here, for example, I can have in DFDFS, I can say that two writes and reads from D1. That's legitimate because I'm going to go then go into two and show you that two has a process called 2.1, which writes, and two other processes that read. How do we detail flow between two complex processes? In DFD0, we can show this general flow. How can we show it in DFD2 and 3? In other words, in DFDFS, we're going to see 2 and 3. And we can show that data is flowing from one to the other. So in 2, we might write like this. Student is giving information. It's going into process 2.1, then process 2.2, then into the database, then into 2.3. And then sending it off to an external process. Wait a second, it's internal. 3.7 is an internal process. Ah, but it's external to this DFD. So I write it outside as though it's like an external system. Because from the perspective of DFD2, it's an external system. So then in, in, in DFD3, I'm going to say he's receiving some data from 2.3. And I'll write exactly which which subsection of two, he's getting his data. In general, from reading a DFD, we do not know which activities come before which others. We don't know any sequence. We don't know if, you know, if we had a, if we had a little bunch of different things that are happening here. Here. We don't know if this process happened first or this process happened first. You know, how can, which we don't know what this is any kind of sequence here. And we can't make a generalization. We could say that if one is reading, probably the writing came before the reading. Um, the exception is when there are arrow connectors. When we do know, then we do know which process came before which. We know this by the direction of the arrows. Right. If there's an arrow from one process to the other, we know that that process happened before the other process. We also have and and or logic in DFTs. And that, I sort of explained that to you. You can either write or or and. If you write or, you mean either when this process finishes, it either does this process or it does this process. This means it does both processes. If we write no sign at all, it means and. Triggers that use and and or. If, if a process only occurs when two previous processes triggered it, we use the and notation. So here's the other way around. This will only occur if it gets both this process and this process to be to give it data. It won't react if only got data from one. Here we here it'll react either way. If we don't write any symbol, it's as though we wrote or, which means as soon as it gets one data, it'll run. Um, I think this is the same picture we saw before. Sure, why it's there. Oh, no. So, one, three, four, one, two, three, four. Here is DFD one. Now, this is a hierarchical structure. DFD one, 
I can go lower also. I could have a DFD called 1.3. In fact, I should have. Notice I should not have DFD 1.1 because this is a basic process. But this is a complex process, so I'm going to need to have another page called DFD 1.3, which will explain whatever this does. So this is the kind of thing you have to make in the lab. And here's the hierarchical structure. DFT FS has in it DFT1, DFT2, and DFT3. And it has in it process one, two, and three. Process three has in it subprocess 3.1. Process one has in it subprocess 1.13 .1, 1 and 1.14. I mean, sorry, we have 1.4. Rules for when to show entities. The conservation of data. A database or external entity that appears in a complex process should also appear in the detailed child DFD. So in other words, if you write a database in the process, for the process, is using some, some complex process using a database. And when you define that database, when you define that complex process, you're going to have to have the database again. External entities that appear in a child DFD should appear in the parents also. So that's also important. Well, basically, in the first DFD FS, you're going to have all the entities, even if one entity is only used by a child process of, of, of DFD three. And then if some small process way down the line uses some external entity, it should appear in the DFDFS and its parents. The database should only appear when one process updates and another reads it. We said that already. All right, that's all for DFD. When do we finish today? I mean, we're with you till 7.30. We just switch classes at five. Five. Wait, well, the other one, is it yeah. ends at five and the next one begins at five or? I mean, we have a break then if you want, or if we want, or both. I think we should have a break because I did enough. I've done the slide. It's only lecture two and I've already finished slide three. Well, we're True? officially supposed to go until five o'clock for software engineering and from then is your next. But we could take like a break from now till then. Not in, I mean, if there's anything to do then. I think we should take a break till now because it's a lot of information that I gave you. Um, next class at five, regular? Next class at five.